Okay, I'm back. We're on to, we were just talking about abrasion, and then this is on to the next page. This is root action. So, oh, not a lot to write here. Just that. So roots, I don't have a great picture for it, but here, this picture, the one that I did get, it shows some bedrock here with some cracks in it. There's soil, there's roots of a tree. And we've got to think about the roots of the tree will actually grow into the cracks. And uh, you would think that a tree, roots of a tree, especially when you see fine roots, are no match for solid rock of earth, bedrock, but it actually is. And what happens is you get very small roots growing in there, and then as that tree gets bigger and bigger, it, the roots will get bigger, and it, that can also have tremendous force and actually break that apart. So root action, another type of physical weathering of rocks. I have some pictures here. This is in China, and I'm just trying to show the roots. This is clinging to sort of a rock wall here. So it shows the aggressive nature of how roots can really attach to rock. Small little crack. Nature will take advantage of that, and uh, this really is anchoring this tree into the into that um, wall right there. This picture, this picture is good, and I hope that it's coming through on the video because you see this tree right here. It's not necessarily, it's not growing in soil. It's growing on this big rock cliff, and this is a pretty serious sized tree. It is just all of its roots are right into this cliff, and you can get a sense a tree this big is in some serious roots. But it started out as just a little tree, so it has expanded this quite uh, quite a lot, I'm sure. This picture I really like because you really can see it. This uh, rock. Uh, outcrop here of this sort of cliff. You can see this tree, again, not growing in soil, it's just growing in this crack, and you can see the crack continue down that we project this out into the future. Chances are, at some point in the future, this whole big boulder is going to fall down, which looks to be quite some way. So, root action causes a good amount of uh, physical weathering. Okay, please pause this and write this down now. Okay, now we're on to chemical weathering. This is a process where there is a chemical reaction uh, in the, with the, among the minerals of the rock that changes it to something else, okay? What's a, a good example of a chemical change? We often use burning. You burn wood. There's a chemical reaction that's what the actual burning process. Now, these rocks aren't burning, but uh, here's some examples of chemical weathering. And the first one we're going to talk about is oxidation which is reaction with oxygen, and we often know it as rusting. And in this case here, you have Fe, which is iron, reacting with oxygen, and it will give you um, iron oxide, Fe2O3. That is rust. And so anytime you see a rock that is reddish, or that sort of a reddish brown, like a rusty color, that has happened to iron that's in the rock, or iron that's uh, often has minerals with a lot of iron in it. Um, so that's, that's good to, that's just a good overall. I have some examples of that. Hold on one second. I thought I had them here in a better order. Bear with me here one second. So anytime you see rocks that are that sort of rusty color, I'm just going to throw this in there. This is in uh, Colorado outside Denver. It's a state park. It's actually a concert venue uh, where they have concerts there. It's called Red Rocks because the rocks are red. And I probably got some pictures here where you can see it. See, this is man-made, but this, the rocks are very red. They stick it from the side. It's quite dramatic here. That is black and white. That's not helping. But you see all the people here, and the rocks are very reddish. And that is oxidation that occurred actually quite some time, uh, a long time ago, of these rocks. Oh, here's another picture. You really see the surface here. It is very red. So that's, again, oxidation, chemical weathering. Uh, another picture there. Oh, and that's me and red rocks in the early 90s. We don't need to literally look at that very much. So let's go back to some chemical weathering here. Um, so that's one process. The, uh, another process that we have is um, the second one, B, water will react with certain minerals in rocks. An example is feldst feldspar will become clay. So uh, the feldspars over time will react with water, and their reaction causes them to actually convert into clay minerals. If you think about the mineral labs we saw in class, we didn't see any clay minerals um, or and actually, they're actually too small, but the clay minerals are a big uh, a section of the mineral world. Um, 
And we definitely didn't see them in the igneous rocks. There's no clay minerals there because that's not how they form. They form this way, igneous rocks, the potassium, plagioclase, feldspar, those form from magma and lava. And then they react over many years with water to form clay. That's my example there. Uh, acid rain, and what I'm going to add, it's not so much acid rain and how we're increasing acid rain by burning coal, which we are. It's just rainwater. The key point here is rainwater is naturally acidic. Okay, so rainwater has a natural uh, pH, which is what we, how we measure, measure sort of how acidic something is or on the opposite end, how basic it is. Seven is a neutral number. Seven is kind of neither acid nor base. And rainwater is 5.6. Okay, so it's a little bit acidic. Uh, for instance, as an example here, lemon juice is a two on that scale. So lemon juice is pretty acidic. But even though it's just slightly acidic, give it enough time, it will react with minerals like calcite. Okay, so calcite, I have a picture up here, and dolomite, both of these react with acid. Dolomite a little uh, less so, as, as we saw during Lab 9. Uh, they react with acid and give them enough time. That rainwater will dissolve them slowly. The way that we saw acid, we saw pretty much stronger acid on calcite. You see it really fits strongly. Uh, the same thing happens exposed to rainwater, but just much slower rate. But over a long period of time, what you could see is things like this. Uh, you, could you could see that chemical weathering. This is Cleopatra's needle. And this shows some chemical weathering um, over time. This is in New York City. It's in C Central Park. And this was really used to have a lot of uh, very clear carvings in there. And over the years that it's been exposed, you see those carvings are much harder to see. This is the, what it looked like prior. I don't know how well this comes through. Where the, where the carvings in there were, were very deep and distinct, and you could really read them. And now they really are very hard, hard to read. I have other examples of that. Um, this is you could see a tombstone here. This is a, uh, made of granite, and this is in from the 1800s, and not a lot of weathering has happened to that uh, the wet, the, because it doesn't, have, uh, the, it doesn't have any calcite or dolomite in, in this case. So it has uh, held up quite well. This one here, this was a marble headstone, tombstone, and it uh, is composed of calcite. This has reacted, obviously a tombstone is out in the elements all the time. And you can often see old tombstones where it's very hard to read anything because it just like dissolves away those minerals over, this has probably been out for 100 years. You know, you're not gonna see this if it's been out for two years. It take, takes much longer, but it is obvious at times. This is a carving off of an old building that was probably in marble, or yeah, it has probably marble here. And it was probably really detailed carving of a little baby's face. And over time, it's dissolved a lot of that away. And this looks, you know, it looks very chemically weathered is, the, is how I'm going to show it. And we saw these already. OK, uh, page three, if you have these notes, there's a tombstone on there. We're going to skip that and go on to page four now.